So welcome to session three of the Elijah Challenge Training 2.0. This is for committed disciples who would like to have a part in fulfilling the Great Commission during these very last days. Once again, at the very bottom, you see our website, www.theelijahchallenge.org. Uh, there are thousands of pages on our website. Uh, many of them are testimonies of what God has done through trained believers and trained servants of God, and also several articles that we have written. If you would like to have this PowerPoint presentation and accompanying YouTube playlist of videos, just email me at Elijah003 at gmail.com. Once again, Elijah003 at gmail.com. Now, in this PowerPoint presentation, there are in fact notes which accompany some of the slides. And if you open up the notes, you can get fuller understanding of the material in the corresponding slide. Now, these notes, when available, can be seen under each slide by clicking on notes underneath each slide at the bottom of the screen when in non-presentation mode. Let me show you what I'm talking about here. Uh, this is non-presentation mode. And if you look at the bottom, you see notes within the circle. You click on notes and this will appear, the notes will appear underneath each slide. Now, not each slide will have these notes, but some of them do. And in these notes, you will find further clarification of the material in the actual slide itself. Now, I'm going to skip to slide 154 and we will continue with session three. Some review first. In our two past sessions, we have looked at the two weapons which the Lord has entrusted to us, supernatural weapons for healing the sick and casting out demons. Number one, authority in the Greek is exousia. Now authority is what we use over things under our authority. To exercise authority, we issue commands, we issue orders to those things under our authority. And the result is primarily up to you. The illustration which I like to give is your dog. Let's say you have a pet dog who is under your authority. And one day your dog is standing in front of you and you want your dog to sit. Now, whether or not he sits, is totally up to you. It is not up to God, it is up to you. You give a command to your dog, you command your dog to sit, and whether or not he sits is totally up to you. He is under your authority. If he does not sit, it is your fault. It is not God's fault, it is your fault. You're the master, the dog is your pet. You have the authority to make him sit. If he does not sit, the problem is you. Now, when it comes to authority over diseases and demons, the result is primarily up to you. Not necessarily totally up to you, but primarily up to you. What do I mean by that? I mean that we have to do our part according to scripture. And our part is issuing a command, an authoritative command to the demon or the disease, which is under our authority. And we will do so with no doubt with no doubt at all. And we will do so with perseverance. No, that is our part. Now, then if you do your part, then it will be done for you, but you must do your part. And that is often where we fail. We fail to do our part. And that's why often people are not healed. Now, the second weapon, which the Lord has entrusted to us is power in the Greek dunamis. Now, power is transferred through the laying on of hands or through physical contact. When Jesus touched people, when he laid hands on people, his supernatural power, his dunamis would flow into them through the physical contact and the people would be healed. So these are the two weapons on which we focus in the Elijah challenge, supernatural authority and power 
to cast out all demons and to cure diseases. Now, by the way, I am not talking about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Gifts in Greek are charisma and in this training, I am not focusing on those supernatural gifts. I am not focusing on the gift of healing. And neither am I focusing on what is called anointing. I am not teaching anointing. Anointing in the Greek is chrisma. But what I am teaching is authority and power. In the Greek, exousia and dunamis. I focus on those two. I am not focusing on gifts, which is charisma, or anointing, which is chrisma. Those two things are separate and distinct from what I am teaching here in the Elijah Challenge. Please keep that in mind. The relationship between authority and power with regard to healing the sick. Let's look at this relationship between authority and power. Authority, as I mentioned earlier, is for giving commands, whether face to face or at a distance from the sick person. Authority is not at all affected by distance. So you can actually minister healing at a distance. And that in fact is what we have been doing over Zoom for the past two sessions. We have been ministering healing at a distance over Zoom. The key thing is we exercise authority by issuing commands with no doubt. Now, power, of course, is transferred by laying hands on the sick person, okay? Now, power, we know Acts 1, verse 8, when the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples, they received power to be witnesses of Jesus Christ. No, that is a different power. That is a power to witness. The power we are talking about here is re with regard to healing the sick. This power is transferred to physical contact. All right. Let's look at how Jesus exercised his authority and power. Luke 13, verse 10. On a Sabbath, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues, and a woman was there who had been crippled by a spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not straighten up at all. Now, the spirit had attacked this woman, crippling her, and caused permanent physical change to her back. She could not straighten up. She was a hunchback. And this left her with a physical infirmity. Therefore, she needed physical healing in her back. So look what Jesus did, verse 12. When Jesus saw her, he called her forward and said to her, Woman, you are set free from your infirmity. Now here, Jesus is using authority to heal this woman. He issues a command, you are set free. Verse 13, then he put his hands on her and immediately she straightened up and praised God. Now, when Jesus put his hands on her, that is when his healing power flowed into her back to heal her back. Immediately, she straightened up. So here we see Jesus using both supernatural authority and power to heal this woman. He issued a command, which was, you are set free from your infirmity. And then he laid hands on her to transfer his healing power into her back. He used both authority and power. Now, a few questions. Did Jesus close his eyes and pray to God for her, as many of us might do today? No, he did not close his eyes. And he did not pray for her, not at all. Prayer is directed at God. He said nothing to God when he healed this woman. Did Jesus engage in any prophetic action directed at the woman? For example, did Jesus proclaim anything to this woman? Did Jesus say, I proclaim healing for you? Did Jesus say, I declare that you are healed. Did Jesus affirm healing for her? Did he say, by my stripes, you are healed? No, he did not. He did not proclaim anything. He did not declare anything. He did not affirm anything to this woman. No, not at all. Was there any priestly action directed up to the father, like singing, 
Did he worship his father? Did he say, hallelujah, thank you, father? Did he direct any action at all up to the father? And the answer is no. There was no priestly action directed up to the father when he healed this woman. And so we see there was no prophetic action, no prophetic utterance. There was no priestly action like prayer, thanksgiving, worship, singing, zero, nothing. Did Jesus say, Father, I command you to be set free. Amen. No, Jesus did not call upon his father first. No, he simply spoke directly to the women. Women, you are set free from your infirmity. And Jesus did not say amen afterwards. Why not? Because amen is something that you say only after you pray. Here, Jesus is not praying. He is commanding this woman to be healed. For example, let's say you want your dog to sit. Would you say the following to your dog? Sit. Amen. No, of course not. It makes no sense at all. What Jesus did here in healing this woman was a 100% pure kingly action directed at the infirmity. It was directed at the infirmity. It was a kingly action. Now, was Jesus using the gift of healing here? And at our last section, session, we saw that the answer is no, he did not. He did not use the gift of healing. Why? Because the gift of healing was not available until Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came, bringing the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit, one of which was the gift of healing. Jesus did not use the gift of healing, but instead he used authority and power to perform this healing. So again, authority and power are different from the gift of healing. Did Jesus first wait for a word of knowledge before daring to heal this woman? Did he wait upon the Holy Spirit to give him a word of knowledge that this woman needed to be healed? And the answer is no. He did not wait for a word of knowledge because Jesus was willing, Jesus healed her. You see, supernatural authority and power over demons and diseases were at his disposal. So Jesus could use them whenever he wanted to. Whenever he was willing, Jesus could heal the sick because supernatural authority and power were at his disposal. Let's look at Matthew 12, verse 9, at another instance of supernatural healing. Going on from that place, he went into their synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. And then he said to the men, stretch out your hand. So what is Jesus doing there? Is he praying to God? Not at all. He is issuing a command directly to this man. He is exercising authority by issuing a command. Stretch out your hand. So he stretched it out and it was completely restored, just as sound as the other. So here, Jesus used authority alone to heal this man with a shriveled hand. I don't know why he did not also use power. I don't know. But what we see here is that he used authority. So it is possible to heal the sick using authority alone. And that is what we have been doing over Zoom for the past two sessions. But I would say whenever possible, use both. Whenever possible, if you are face to face with the person who needs healing, use both. Issue commands and lay hands on them wherever they need the healing. Why is it better, do I think, to use both rather than just one or the other? Because two are better than one. Two arms, two hands are better than one. Two legs are better than just one. I believe you see what I'm saying here. Now, the usual questions. Did Jesus close his eyes and pray to God for this man with a shriveled hand? No, there was no prayer at all. Did Jesus engage in any prophetic action directed at this man with a shriveled hand? Did he proclaim anything to him? Did he declare anything? Did he affirm by my stripes you are healed? No, there was no prophetic action at all directed to this man. 
there was no priestly action directed up to the Father. There was no singing, no thanksgiving, no hallelujah, nothing directed up to the Father. No priestly action, no prophetic action. Did Jesus say, Father, we command you to stretch out your hand. Amen. Now that is confusing. Is he commanding the Father to stretch out his hand? Of course not. He did not call upon his father. He spoke directly to this man with a withered hand. Stretch out your hand. If you want your dog to sit, would you say to your dog, Father, sit. Amen. Of course not. It sounds like you are commanding the father to sit, doesn't it? So please do not do that. When you are issuing commands to a disease or a demon, you don't say, Father, in Jesus' name, be healed. No. Now, if you are engaged in prayer directly to the Father, let's say you are asking the Father to, to provide you a good wife, to provide you a good job. Yes, that's fine. You would say, Father, in Jesus' name, please grant me a godly wife. Please grant me a good job in Jesus' name. Amen. That is fine. But when you are issuing a command to something under your authority, you don't say, Father. You see, you just speak directly to your dog, to the disease or the demon. And after you are done issuing the command, you do not say, Amen. Amen is something you say only after you pray. So don't get so religious, all right? Just issue the command. What Jesus did was a 100% pure kingly action directed at the man. Stretch out your hand. It was a pure command. There was no praying. There was no hallelujahs. There was no prophesying. No, it was a pure kingly action, a command. Stretch out your hand. Was Jesus using the gift of healing here? And the answer, of course, is no. The gift of healing here was not yet available. This is the Gospels well before the day of Pentecost. And the gift of healing was not available until Pentecost in the book of Acts when the Holy Spirit came. Jesus is using authority and power to heal this man. Did Jesus first wait for a word of knowledge before healing this man? Did he wait upon the Holy Spirit? Did he wait for a word of knowledge before daring to heal this man? No, he did not. Because he was willing, Jesus healed him. Supernatural authority and power were at his disposal to use, especially when he preached the gospel. And so if he was willing, Jesus could heal the sick. Now, remember what Jesus promised in John 14, 12. In John 14, 12, Jesus said, those who believe in me will do the works I have been doing. And now we have seen how Jesus did his works. You can heal the sick exactly as Jesus did by using his authority and power. Later, we shall see that the Lord gave this very same authority and power to his disciples, and you are his disciples. So you heal the sick exactly as Jesus did, according to John 14, 12. You will use the Lord's supernatural authority and power to heal the sick exactly as he did, especially when you are proclaiming the kingdom of God to those who never heard the gospel. Now, before we go on, let me just say something about Paul and the handkerchiefs in Acts chapter 19. Acts 19, verse 11, God did extraordinary miracles through Paul so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured and the evil spirits left them. Now, how do we explain this? Was this a gift of healing given to Paul? Well, let me give you my own interpretation, my own conclusion on this based on my understanding. What happened here can be argued as the Lord's healing power transferred from Paul to the handkerchiefs through physical contact with Paul. And then that healing power was transferred to the sick and demonized as 
the handkerchiefs and aprons were put upon the sick. So my interpretation is that even here in the book of Acts with these handkerchiefs, it was healing power, which, be, which was being transferred, resulting in the healing of people who had diseases and evil spirits. Now, we see that this authority and power over disease are very distinct from the gift of healing, okay? Let's look at the details. There are four major differences between authority and power and the gift of healing, four major differences. Difference number one. Number one, we have already discussed earlier. There is a difference when they appear in scripture. That is, authority and power to heal were given well before Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came bringing the gifts, including the gift of healing. Again, in the Gospels, we see authority and power at work, and we shall see it at work through the disciples as well in a moment. By contrast, the gift of healing was not seen in the scriptures until the day of Pentecost at the very earliest when the Holy Spirit came, bringing, of course, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, including the gift of healing. So this is a very crucial difference between authority and power on the one hand and the gift of healing on the other hand. Difference number two, difference in frequency. Every believer is given a measure of this authority and power, according to John 14, 12, where Jesus promised that we would do the works exactly as he did, that we would do the works that he did. But not every believer has the gift of healing. In 1 Corinthians 12, verse 30, Paul says, do all have gifts of healing? That, of course, is a rhetorical question, and the answer is no, not all have gifts of healing. But every believer has a measure of the supernatural authority and power over diseases and demons. For what purpose? For sharing the kingdom of God to those who never heard. Difference number three, difference in operation. The operation of the authority and power to heal is very different from the operation of the gift of healing. Among other differences, the gift of healing is not always in operation. Why? Because it depends on the Holy Spirit. And so I do not think you can operate in the gift of healing whenever you want. It depends on the Holy Spirit. But authority and power, by contrast, are always available when the gospel is being shared with those who never heard. When you are sharing the gospel with people who do not know Jesus, that authority and power are at your disposal to use to heal the sick. And why do you want to heal the sick in that context? You heal the sick as dramatic and compelling evidence that Jesus is in fact the Messiah, the only way to the one true God. And we shall see this in a moment. We shall see in a moment that this authority and power are always available when we are sharing the gospel. Difference number four. This is a difference in primary function between authority and power and the gift of healing. Let's first look at the function of the gift of healing and compare it to the function of authority and power. Okay, 1 Corinthians 12 verse four. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same spirit. So here, Paul, in this chapter, he is talking about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, which, of course, include the gift of healing. And look what Paul says, verse 7. Now, to each one, the manifestation of the spirit is given for the common good. Now, what does Paul mean by the common good? Of course, he means the common good of the body of Christ. The whole context of this chapter is about the body of Christ. Therefore, when Paul refers to the common good, he is obviously talking about the common good of the church, of the body of Christ, consisting of believers. Therefore, the gift of healing as one of the nine gifts is primarily for ministering healing to infirm believers. You see, all nine gifts are primarily for building up the church. Therefore, the gift of healing is also primarily for ministering healing to sick believers. Look what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 14, 12. 
so it is with you. Since you are eager to have spiritual gifts, try to excel in gifts that build up the church. Therefore, it's clear that the gift of healing is primarily for serving and ministering healing to sick believers in the context of building up the church. Now, this is the most common context for most believers. When they minister to the sick, it is almost always to sick believers in the church. And that is fine. And that is the purpose of the gift of healing for ministering to believers. Now, as I mentioned earlier, my primary focus is not on the gift of healing, but it is on supernatural authority and power. So we're going to look at that in just a moment. The function of authority and power is very different from that of the gift of healing. It's different. It's not the same. Luke 9, verse 1. Let's look at the primary function of authority and power. When Jesus had called the 12 together, he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases, including, of course, COVID-19. Now here, Jesus is not giving his disciples the gift of healing. No, that did not come until the day of Pentecost. But here he is giving them supernatural power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases. And I emphasize including COVID-19. Now, why did Jesus give them this power and authority? What was the purpose? Well, verse 2, he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God. The primary purpose for which he gave them this power and authority was for them to be sent out to preach the gospel of the kingdom of God to those who never heard and to heal the sick as they proclaim the kingdom of God to those who never heard. Therefore, the Lord's supernatural power and authority over demons and diseases are available for us to heal the sick when Ever the kingdom of God is proclaimed. When we are proclaiming the kingdom of God to those who never heard, his supernatural power and authority are at our disposal to heal the sick. Now, why should we heal the sick? Well, the ensuing miracles are compelling evidence for the gospel. When we heal the sick, as we are proclaiming the kingdom of God to those who never heard, those miracles will be irrefutable and compelling evidence to the hearers that the gospel is true, that Jesus is in fact the Messiah, that he is in fact the only way to the one true God, that he did in fact die on the cross for our sins, and he did in fact rise from the dead on the third day. The miracles that we will do as we are proclaiming the gospel to those who never heard will be compelling evidence to, yes, to those who never heard that Jesus is in fact the Messiah. Now, let me just say something about gifts, all right? Now, gifts, as in the gifts of the Spirit, now, they are to be given to our friends, that is, our brethren in the body of Christ, okay? That's what gifts are for. You give gifts to your friends, okay? In this context, uh, our friends refer to our brethren in the body of Christ. And this is in accordance with 1 Corinthians chapter 12, where it talks about ministering to one another within the body of Christ. It's through gifts. But authority and power are directed over our enemies. That is, diseases and demons in the context of proclaiming the kingdom of God to those who never heard. With the Lord's supernatural authority and power, we destroy the work of the enemy as proof of the gospel. Sickness and demonization are enemies to be vanquished, especially in the context of preaching the gospel to those who never heard. So here you see the difference between the gift of healing and authority and power. Gift of healing is for our friends, our brethren in Christ. But authority and power is to be used against our enemies 
And in the context of proclaiming the kingdom of God to those who never heard, sickness and demonization are enemies to be vanquished, to be defeated. And when they are defeated, when they are vanquished, those to whom we are sharing the gospel have been given uncompelling evidence that the gospel we just shared with them is the absolute truth, that Jesus has authority to save them and grant them eternal life. Authority is foundational and greater than power. In the beginning, God said, let there be light. Now, according to the original Hebrew in Genesis, what God said was light be, light be. God was issuing a command to the light to be. God therefore used authority to create the universe. He was issuing a command to the light to be. Therefore, God used authority to create the universe. Therefore, as God's workers, we must understand the nature of authority in order to use it effectively to heal the sick and cast out demons. This is one of our primary goals in the Elijah Challenge to teach you the nature of authority such that you can use it effectively to heal the sick and cast out demons, especially when you are sharing the gospel with those who never heard. Now, notice Jesus never commanded his disciples to pray to God for the sick. Never. Not once in the four gospels, did Jesus ever tell his disciples, did he ever tell us to pray for the sick? But sadly, it is a, it's a tradition within the church. It's called the healing prayer. But Jesus in the gospels never told us to pray for the sick. Rather, he told us to heal the sick. When he sent his disciples out to preach the gospel, he commanded them to heal the sick exactly as he did that's john 14 12. we are to do the works that he did and exactly as he did them again jesus never told his disciples to pray for the sick as is traditionally done in the church today he commanded them to heal the sick when he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of god to those who never heard now, for us, what's the difference between praying to God for the sick and healing the sick? Is there a difference between these two? Let's examine this question. Which of the two would appear to be easier and less risky for us to attempt in front of other people? Let's say you are proclaiming the kingdom of God to a group of people outside somewhere and there happens to be a sick person there and that sick person wants to be healed in front of all those other people which would appear to be easier and less risky for you to do to pray to god and ask god to heal that person or for you to perform the miracle of healing that person in front of those people which would appear to be easier and less risky for you to do well, let's discuss this. Let's say you decide to pray and ask God to heal that person. And so what you do is you go to that person who has asked for healing and you say, Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we ask you to heal this person according to your will, Lord. Thank you, Father. We, in Jesus' name, we leave the results up to you. Amen. And after that, you ask the person, are you healed? Is the pain gone? And the person says, no, it's still there. So what do you say? You say, well, it's not God's will. It's not God's time for you to be healed. But let me tell you, the gospel is true. Even though God said no, uh, the gospel is true. Okay. And so when you pray to God for the sick and nothing happens, you have not failed. You blame it on God. You say, it's not God's will. Okay. So how about Number two, let's say you decide to perform a miraculous healing in front of the crowd. So you go to that person 
and you say, in the name of Jesus, be healed now. Okay, you yourself attempt to perform a miracle in front of those other people. Be healed in Jesus' name. And then you ask, are you healed? And the person says, no. How do you feel then? <laughs> well, you have made a fool of yourself in front of those people. You have failed. What you said to that person did not come to pass. You failed. You have embarrassed yourself. So the answer to the question at the top would be, it is much easier and less risky for us to pray to God for the sick. And after that, to leave the results entirely in the hands of God. That would be far easier and less risky for us to do. Absolutely. Praying to God for the sick and leaving the results up to him would be far, far less risky. Absolutely. But Jesus never commanded us to pray for the sick. Never, never, never never rather he commands us to heal the sick especially when we are proclaiming the kingdom of god should we obey his command or not well if you are a true disciple of jesus christ you will want to obey his commands correct so if you are a disciple we must be determined to obey his command, to heal the sick, not just to pray for the sick, but to heal the sick. And that is the purpose of this training, to teach you how to heal the sick effectively, exactly as Jesus did. If you are a real disciple of Jesus Christ, you will want to obey his commands. Absolutely. If you do not want to obey his commands, are you truly a disciple of Jesus? Ask yourself that. Now, the primary purpose and function of authority and power over disease and demons are demonstrating to the world, to those who never heard through the miraculous, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the Savior of the world. That is the primary purpose of this supernatural authority and power, which the Lord entrusts to us, his disciples. It is to be used primarily when proclaiming the kingdom of God. The miracles are compelling, irrefutable proof that the gospel is true, that Jesus is the Messiah, the only way to the one true God. Now, here's a caveat for you at the bottom. There can be significant overlap between authority and power on the one hand and the gifts of the Holy Spirit on the other hand. Let me explain to you that caveat. Authority and power, although it is primarily to be used when sharing the gospel to those who never heard, it can in fact be used to minister healing to sick believers as well. Yes, it can be. Especially when we study James chapter five in the very last session, we will see this to be the, to be the case. Now, and the gifts of the Holy Spirit can be in operation when we are sharing the gospel with those who never heard. Yes, it can be. So what I am saying is that there is a lot of overlap. There is much overlap between the two. However, according to scripture, there is a primary difference in function. Primarily, power and authority are to be used when sharing the gospel. And primarily, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, including the gift of healing, primarily is to be used when ministering to sick believers in the context of church. So please keep all of this in mind. Yes, there will be overlap. Our task in the Elijah Challenge is to teach disciples to minister healing in this very context of proclaiming the gospel to those who never heard which is exactly the same context in which Jesus and his early disciples ministered. When Jesus was here 2,000 years ago, did he come primarily to minister to believers? Did he come to minister healing to sick believers? No, 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 he did not come to minister to sick believers. But he came to save the lost. He came to save those who never heard. And that's why he performed miracles. The miracles were the evidence that he had authority to forgive sin and grant eternal life. Okay, that is the context of this training. Now, of course, 
uh, many of you who are trained, you will use what you learn to minister to sick believers or even to minister to yourself. Uh, I get it, yes, and uh, it will work. But understand that the primary purpose of this power and authority is not to be a blessing primarily to believers, to sick believers, but primarily to be a blessing to the gospel, to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ to those who never heard. Therefore, when proclaiming the gospel to those who never heard, we should be ministering to the sick and demonized exactly as Jesus and his disciples did, which we are now studying in painful detail. Let me share with you a testimony, a very interesting testimony. <clears throat> the woman you see here, her name is Pranima Sabitri. And this testimony was shared by our India coordinator who is based in Orissa, India. Let me share with you what he sent me just earlier this year. For seven years, a young woman named Purnima had been possessed by a legion of demons. She became a terror to her parents by punching people, picking up things in the house and throwing them around and running off into the jungle. She and her husband live around 50 kilometers from my hometown in Orissa, and they belong to a high caste people group called the Yadav. To treat Purnima for her condition, hundreds of thousands of rupees were spent on various sorcerers in different districts. But after going to all these districts, spending so much money, but with no change in Purnima, both were discouraged and at the end of their rope. Finally, through one of our believers, they heard about our Elijah Challenge ministry. On the last Sunday of January earlier this year, Purnima was brought to us. As soon as we began to minister to her, rebuking the demons in the name of Jesus, she began screaming at the top of her lungs. The horrible legion of demons left her and Purnima was set free. Both she and her grateful husband accepted Jesus as their only Lord and Savior. She is now boldly witnessing for the Lord, telling others that Jesus is the son of the only true God. He delivered me from an abhorrent legion of demons. Now, there's much more. Listen. Now, Pranima had accepted Jesus for only 18 to 20 days. Then the Lord began to use her powerfully, a brand new believer. A month ago, a young man she knew had broken his lower back in an accident and had been taken to the local hospital. But due to the severity of the injury, he was advised to go for more advanced treatment at the hospital in the city. Following treatment there, he was told to go home. He was to take prescription medication along with complete bed rest for three months. He was ordered not to stand up or even to sit up in bed. One day, our brand new believer, Pranima, went to see him at his home. Without saying a word, she laid her hand on him and commanded healing in the name of Jesus Christ, just as she had seen us doing when we were ministering to the sick. Astonishingly, within a few minutes, the young man sat up in bed. His mother, who was present, rushed over to him and scolded him for disobeying the doctor's orders for complete bed rest, no sitting or standing. Pranima shared with her about how Jesus had delivered her from the legion of demons. The young man said that while Pranima ministered to him, he felt, quote unquote, someone touch him and help him to sit up. Then he got up out of bed and began to walk around slowly. Now, Pernima had accepted Jesus only a few weeks ago and knew very little about the Lord. But God graciously used her, nevertheless. Soon, she was sharing her testimony with many Hindus. 
A few days later, sick and demonized people began coming to her home. Many were healed and delivered from demons. And she is a brand new believer. More and more people started coming to her from her village as well as from a nearby village. By the grace of God, many of them accepted Jesus Christ. Many of them had been healed. Pernima started a house church in her home, and now every evening between 12 and 15 people would gather for teaching and prayer. And she is a brand new believer. She only knew the Lord last January. Since she is illiterate, her daughter would read from the Bible for her. She is illiterate. And she has started a house church. In this way, Pernima has reached three villages as she testifies about the Lord's power to heal, to deliver, and to save. And so John 14, 12 has been fulfilled in Pernima. Those who believe in me will do the works I have been doing. But the question is, why does this almost never happen? Why do we always hear of such things happening so rarely. Why is it that most believers, they believe in Jesus for 10, 20, 30 years, they cannot do this, they cannot do this. Even after going to church for decades, being baptized, following Jesus, decades, but how come they are not doing this? Why not? Why does this always, almost never happen? <clears throat> Well, let me tell you why. Note that Purnima, a brand new believer, had never been exposed to the tradition of praying to God for the sick, as sadly, nearly all Christians are. She had never been exposed to this tradition. She had never seen someone praying for the sick, never. All she knew was what she observed our trained coworker do when he healed the sick, that is, laying his hand on the sick and commanding healing. That's all she knew. She never knew the existence of what is called traditional healing prayer. She did not know it existed. All she knew was, oh, uh, lay hands on the sick and command healing. Therefore, that is exactly what she did for the bedridden young man. In this way, the Lord used her to perform a powerful miracle. But sadly, in the church today, we are exposed to quite a few traditions which are actually not biblical. And as a result, most Christians are helpless, paralyzed to, to do anything like this. Very tragically, traditions in the church have greatly hindered ministry to the sick. And especially on the mission field where the gospel is preached to resistant people groups who need to witness miracles before they will believe. On the mission field, that's where you find the Muslims, the Buddhists, the Hindus, the idol worshippers, those who believe in witchcraft, sorcerers, animists. Those are what we call resistant people groups. People groups who are resistant to the gospel. And the only way to bring them to Jesus is for them to witness powerful miracles that their gods, their beliefs cannot do. And after they witness such miracles, then they will believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. In the Gospels, Jesus never taught his disciples to pray to God for the sick and then to, re and then to leave the results up to him. No, he did not. But this is what is done traditionally in the church today. So you see why there are so few miracles in the church today. You see why the church is so weak in missions today. Rather, Jesus taught his disciples to heal the sick using the supernatural authority and power he had given them. Therefore, when we teach disciples today, when you disciples teach others today, we must focus on emphasize the crucial difference between the tradition of praying to God for the sick 
and actually healing the sick as Jesus taught and commanded his disciples to do. We have to make that difference absolutely clear so that those whom we train will not afterwards go around just praying for the sick. No, we want them to be healing the sick. So we have to make it absolutely clear. We are not teaching praying for the sick. We are teaching actually healing the sick as Jesus did. And this includes teaching disciples today the correct terminology. We're not praying for the sick, okay? We're not praying for the sick. Sadly, among those who are trained, they continue to say, pray for the sick. We are not praying for the sick. We are healing the sick. If you continue to use the terminology, pray for the sick, even after you are trained, let me tell you, those people whom you want to train, they are not going to be well trained, okay? Because when you say pray for the sick, they have one thing in mind. That means, oh, we're going to cry out to God and leave the results up to God. That's what praying for the sick means. But that's not what we are doing. So please change your terminology. Change your vocabulary. Don't talk about praying for the sick anymore. Stop. You are confusing the believers. But say heal the sick or minister to the sick. Someday, those that you train will become trainers themselves. What I do is I train the trainers. And some of you will become trainers. So someday, those that you train will become trainers themselves. Therefore, we must train them as precisely as possible. Otherwise, those that they train in the future, they will fall short. We must be as precise as possible when we train people. Let me give you a good illustration of this, all right? Now, all of us are familiar with snipers, right? Snipers in the military. Now, if a sniper wants to take out a target 3,000 meters away, his aim must be precisely on the target. It must be precise. Everything must be precise to hit a target 3,000 meters away. But if his aim is just one degree off the target, by the time the bullet reaches the target 3,000 meters away, it will miss the target by many meters. I believe you understand this illustration. That is why when we teach others, we must be precise in every way, including the terminology which we use. Now we call. Luke 9, verse 1, when Jesus had called the 12 together, he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons, demons from people, that is, and to cure diseases, including COVID-19. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. So they set out and went from village to village. They, meaning the 12, preaching the gospel and healing people everywhere after receiving this power and authority from the lord they obeyed they went out village to village preaching the gospel and actually healing people everywhere not praying for the sick everywhere but healing people everywhere now do present day disciples do this do present day disciples go from village to village preaching the gospel and healing people everywhere do present day disciples actually do that? And the answer is no, not at all. Some do go from village to village, but they are not healing people everywhere. If anything, they are praying for the sick everywhere. They are not healing the sick anywhere. So we are not doing this today. Not to mention, we don't do what the early disciples did in the book of Acts. Not only we don't do what the disciples did in the gospels, we are not doing what the early disciples did in the book of Acts. So there is something terribly wrong with this picture, is there not? Shouldn't we be doing what these early disciples did? Shouldn't we be doing those very same things today? But for some reason, we are not. The church needs to examine herself. Why are we not obeying the commands of the Lord? Why are we getting so religious? In a sense, we are getting hypocritical. We say we must obey the Lord, but there are certain commands we do not want to obey. To me, that's hypocrisy. 
we have to examine ourselves. Why are we not doing what the early disciples did? Now, of course, if you are a cessationist, you have your answer right away. A cessationist will teach that there's no more such supernatural power and authority. It is gone, okay? But I believe that most of you who are listening to me are not cessationists. If you are not a cessationist, you have to answer this question. If you are a serious disciple, a committed servant of God, you believe that the scriptures are authoritative and inerrant and inspired. Okay, so why are we not doing this today? We will address this painful question head on. Now, what about disciples who are not apostles? Notice that in Luke 9, Jesus called the 12 who were later to be known as the apostles. Now, we are not all apostles. Most of us are just disciples. Do we ordinary disciples, do we have any of this supernatural power and authority? Well, let's see. Luke 10 verse 1, after this, the Lord appointed 70 others who were not apostles, and he sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. All right, now we have 70 more disciples. Did Jesus give to the 70 disciples any of this authority and power over demons and diseases when he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God? Let's find out. Let's see what Jesus commanded the 70 to do. Verse 9, heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God is near you. Jesus commanded the 70 to heal the sick and proclaim the kingdom of God. Which means what? Which means that Jesus also gave to the 70 supernatural authority and power over diseases and demons. If he had not given them this authority and power, he would have commanded them to pray to God for the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God is near you. But he didn't command them to pray for the sick. He said, heal the sick. Therefore, he clearly gave them the authority and power to do so, to actually heal the sick. So we conclude that every disciple who is sent out is given a measure of this supernatural authority and power to heal the sick and cast out demons. And all of us, every disciple, every believer is sent out as a witness of Jesus Christ to the world. Therefore, every disciple actually has been given this supernatural authority and power, but we have never been taught about it. The church has never taught us about the supernatural power and authority which we have through Christ who lives in us. And not only that, the church has not taught us how to use this power and authority to heal the sick and cast out demons as witnesses of Jesus Christ. Now, what about God's will to heal a sick person or not to heal that sick person? This is something that often occurs to a believer when we want to minister to someone who is sick. We are thinking, but what about God's will? If it's not God's will to heal this person, then I will be ministering to this person in vain. Nothing will happen. So let's discuss the issue of God's will to heal or not to heal. When Jesus commands us to proclaim the kingdom, is it God's will for the kingdom of God to be proclaimed to the world? Absolutely Yes, of course, yes. When God commands us to do something, it means it's his will for us to do it, correct? And so when Jesus commands us to proclaim the kingdom, it is absolutely clear, it's absolutely obvious that it's his will for us to proclaim the kingdom of God to the world, of course. When God commands us to do something, it's his will for us to do it. That's obvious, that goes without saying. In the same way, when Jesus commands us to heal the sick, is it God's will for the sick to be healed when the kingdom of God is being proclaimed to those who never heard? Absolutely, absolutely. When Jesus says heals the sick, it means he wants us to heal the sick. It means that he wants the sick to be healed by us. And so when you are proclaiming the kingdom of God to the lost, it is God's will for the sick to be healed as evidence to the hearers 
that Jesus Christ is the Messiah so that they may believe on him and receive eternal life. I hope that is absolutely clear. Therefore, context is very important. Context is important. When the context is proclaiming the kingdom of God to those who never heard, God's will is, yes, I want them to be healed, and I want you to heal them. Context is very important. And so the primary context of this training is sharing the gospel with those who never heard. Now, of course, sick believers can also be healed. But for me, that is simply a side benefit. It's a side benefit of the power and authority which Jesus gives us for advancing the gospel of the kingdom of God to those who never heard. I hope that is clear for you. Again, Luke 10, verse 9. Heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God has come near to you. Now, the Lord commands us to heal the sick when we proclaim the kingdom of God. It's a command, right? It's a command. Command means we must do it. Therefore, it is God's will for the sick to be healed when the kingdom of God is being proclaimed. Absolutely. So that souls will accept Christ and be saved. Okay. That is absolutely clear. Now, therefore, authority and power over diseases and demons was also given to the 70 disciples who were not apostles. And this was given to them when they were sent out to proclaim the kingdom of God. We are commanded to heal the sick who are there when proclaiming the kingdom of God. Therefore, this command does not depend on the leading of the Holy Spirit, but rather on the context. When we are preaching the gospel of the kingdom to those who never heard, we are commanded to heal the sick. We do not need to be led by the Holy Spirit to heal the sick. No. But we have the word of God. We have the command. We have the logos. Heal the sick. You have the written word of God. The written command from Jesus. Heal the sick. So when you are proclaiming the kingdom of God to the lost, you do not necessarily need a rhema or a word of knowledge or the leading of the Holy Spirit before healing the sick. No. The context of evangelism gives you the authority. Not only authority, but it commands you to heal the sick who are there. By contrast, the operation of the gifts of the Holy Spirit indeed depends on the leading of the Holy Spirit. Yes, if you want to operate in the gifts, you had better, yes, be led by the Holy Spirit. For example, the manifestation of the word of knowledge for healing the sick indeed depends on the Holy Spirit. If you receive a word of knowledge, then yes, you can heal that person. But if you don't receive a word of knowledge from the Holy Spirit regarding who needs to be healed or from what, there is little you can do. But the use of authority and power is different. Different. If there are infirm people present when we are preaching the gospel, we just heal them using authority and power. We don't need to be led by the Holy Spirit. We are already commanded by Jesus to heal them. So obey and get it done. Heal the sick, cast out demons, and then people who are set free will be very grateful and they will believe in Jesus. As simple as that. That is what we are seeing in India now, time and time and time and time again. One more time, Luke 10, verse 9. Heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God is near you. Notice there are two commands here. Heal the sick and then proclaim the kingdom of God. Two commands. Now, why did Jesus command his disciples to heal the sick before proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom? Notice the command to heal the sick comes first. Only after that comes the command to proclaim the kingdom of God. So according to this, Jesus commands us to heal the sick before proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. Now, usually we don't do this, do we? Traditionally, this is what we do. Let's say we have a, a friend, a neighbor, who is, an un, who, who, is a, uh, who doesn't know the Lord, and they are sick. 
and they want to be healed. So typically, what do we do? Well, we go to them. And first, we share the gospel. First, we share the love of God through Jesus Christ. And then, hopefully, we will lead them to say the sinner's prayer. And after the sinner's prayer, after they've accepted Jesus, then maybe we might ask God to heal them. Maybe we might minister to them for their healing. But always, first, we preach the gospel. And the healing is secondary. It comes later. OK, no, I get it. I get it. So why did Jesus command them to heal the sick first before proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom? Why? Well, I'll give you an illustration for why we should heal the sick first when reaching out to the unreached. Let's say you go on a mission trip to a third world country. It could be a Hindu country, a Muslim country, Buddhist country, whatever. And you are going to a region which is unreached and you enter a village and the village is unreached. There's no church. There's no believer. The gospel has never been preached there. And you want to go from door to door to door in that village to share the gospel. Okay. So let's say you approach the first dwelling. It could be a hut or a shed of some kind. And you knock on the door if there is a door because you want to ask for permission to come in and tell them about Jesus, okay? So the owner of the house comes to the door, if there is a door, and you are now standing face to face with a family member of the home, okay? So what do you say at that moment in order so that you can get inside the house to tell them about Jesus? You have one of two options here, one of two alternatives, let us say. Let me give you the first alternative, okay? This is what you do. Knock, knock, knock. Person comes to the door and you say, hello, uh, I'm a Christian and I'm from a church. Uh, may I come in and tell you how much God loves you through his son, Jesus Christ? Can I come in and share the gospel with you? God loves you. That's alternative number one, all right? Alternative number two, you say the following. Knock, 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 knock. The person comes to the door and you say, hello, do you have any sick people, sick family members in the house whom you would like to be miraculously healed for absolutely free? Okay, think about it. Which one of those two alternatives will be more likely to get you inside that house to tell the family about the love of God through Jesus Christ? The answer is obvious. If you use alternative number one, typically you will get a door slammed in your face. The Hindu or the Muslim or the Buddhist, they have their own religion. And they've been worshiping that religion for decades, for generations. Why should they want to switch to your Western religion known as Christianity? Why? There's no reason. They have their own religion. You have yours. I have mine. Let's Let's agree to disagree, okay? Typically, they're not interested, all right? And so, alternative number one is generally not very fruitful. How about alternative number two? Well, alternative number two is completely a different story. You see, in the third world, many of the homes have sick family members. Why? Because they worship false religions. They believe in witchcraft. They call sorcerers. Uh, they live in ignorance, the conditions are very unsanitary, so sickness is actually rampant in third world countries. I heard that in India, in the villages, nine out of every 10 homes has a sick family member, okay? And typically those family members have tried everything to, uh, to treat their family, their sick family member. They have tried uh, sorcerers, of course, uh, various sorcerers, one sorcerer after another comes in, nothing happens, and they try a doctor or go to a hospital or local medicine. They try everything, spending a ton of money, nothing works. And suddenly you show up and say, hey, would you like your family member to be healed miraculously for free? Boy, they will ask you in, okay? Do you see this? Do you see this? The way to preach the gospel is not to bring up religion first, no. It's called felt needs. 
most people's felt needs in the third world are physical healing. And this is in accordance with God's commands. Heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God is near you. And so when you are standing at the door, according to alternative number two, you don't mention anything about the gospel. Not necessarily. You don't talk about God. You don't talk about Jesus. You talk about healing. Would you like your sick family member to be healed? And generally, they will say, yes, you will go in and you will heal that sick family member. A miracle will take place. The eyes of that family will be wide open. Their hearts will be wide open to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And generally, the whole family accepts Jesus. Now, typically in India, what is happening is the following. Our trained harvest workers have been performing many miracles, the, more than 3,000 since the beginning of 2018. So now the word is spreading that our Elijah Challenge harvest workers can perform miracles. And so typically what happens is that uh, a Hindu family, uh, they have a sick family member and they have tried everything, nothing works. They've spent a ton of money, no result. The family member is still sick. And so as a last resort, then they say, okay, call for that Elijah challenge worker. We tried everything, nothing else works. Now we're desperate. We'll try anything. So they'll call our worker because they have heard that miracles have been taking place to our workers. So our workers go, they minister to the sick family member with power and authority and a miracle takes place. It can be instant or it can take a little time, but the miracle takes place. And after it does, the family, they are so grateful. And now they want to hear about our God. Who is your God? Well, his name is Jesus. Let me tell you more about him. Typically, the whole family accepts Christ. And then what happens is the family member, they, they will want to know more because they have accepted Christ and they might ask our harvest worker, oh, when can you come back? We would like to know more about Jesus. And of course, that's exactly what the harvest worker wants to do. And so he says, oh, yes, I'll be back this Sunday and I'll teach you more about Jesus. In fact, every Sunday I will come back and we, we will pray and we will talk about Jesus. We will study the Bible. And there you go. A house church has been born just like that in one single visit, a house church can be planted because of the miracle which has taken place. And so now in India, we have approaching 900 house churches, many of them planted in that very way since the beginning of 2018. And these house churches consist of Hindus, Hindus, not Catholics, but Hindus, many of them gospel resistant Hindus because of the miracles. The only way to reach the billions of gospel resistant people groups in the third world today is through this supernatural power and authority. The authority is the tip of the spear. That's the tip of the spear that allows you to penetrate these highly resistant people groups. Now, did the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost supplant or negate this command to heal the sick even before proclaiming the gospel or leading people to Christ? And the answer is no, absolutely not. When the Holy Spirit came, he did not negate what Jesus commanded in the gospels. In fact, later in the book of Acts, we will see that people accepted Christ only after they witnessed or heard of the miraculous healings. In the book of Acts, this is the pattern we generally see. First, the miracles, then the people believed in Jesus. And that is the pattern that we want to establish in missions today. First, the miracles, then people believe. We have to follow the Bible. We have to follow the book of Acts. But sadly, the church and even missionary organizations, we are not really following the Bible. Luke chapter 10, verse 17, the 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. So these 70 or 72, after being sent out by Jesus and commanded to heal the sick and proclaim the kingdom of God, they went out and then they returned from their mission trip with joy. 
And they said, hey, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. And this is what properly trained disciples will experience when they return from ministering on the field. That is what you will experience if you are properly trained. You will experience inexpressible joy at the miracles they have witnessed. But today, typically, when you go on a mission trip, this is not what you experience. No, it is not. And it's very sad. You can experience what the 72 experience. See demons cast out, people miraculously healed, people accepting Christ. You can experience that if you are properly trained. But sadly today, even on the mission field, this is very rarely seen. This is generally not the experience of disciples today. No, 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 it's sad. But that does not have to be the case. So summarizing what we have learned so far, the 12 apostles were given authority and power over disease and demons when Jesus sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God. And in the same way, the 70 were also given a measure of this authority and power when they were sent out. Here is my conclusion. A measure of authority and power over diseases, demons was given to whomever the Lord sent out to proclaim the kingdom of God to the lost. And all of us, every disciple is sent out as a witness of Jesus Christ. So every one of us has been given a measure of this authority and power to cast out all demons from people and to heal the sick. Now, why only a measure of authority? Why? Well, I believe that not all disciples receive the same measure of authority and power from the Lord. For example, I think apostles may receive a very high measure of a power and authority, which is not given to every believer. But let me tell you this. When, when you start out, okay, you will be given some measure of power and authority. And if the Lord sees that you are trusted with the little measure which has been given you, you go out and use it, even though it's not much, but you go out and use it, healing the sick, casting out demons, preaching the gospel. If you faithfully use the little measure that has been given you, then the Lord knows that you can be trusted with a much greater measure. Then the Lord will give you a greater measure of authority and power. You will be promoted within the army of God. You will be given greater authority. So I say to you, it doesn't matter how much you whatever measure has been given to you at the outset, that doesn't matter. What matters is what do you do with the authority and power which has been given to you now? What do you do with that measure of authority and power if you use it faithfully to heal the sick, preach the gospel, win souls, advance the kingdom of God? If you use it faithfully, God will know that you can be trusted with much greater authority and power and he will give it to you. You will grow in authority, you will grow in power you will grow in mountain moving faith. And that is what we will address at our next session. And so I conclude, every disciple is sent out to the world as a witness of Jesus Christ. Every one of us has been given a measure of the supernatural power and authority to heal the sick and cast out demons. Every one of us. And so I challenge you, share the gospel with at least one person this week. If they need healing, heal them in Jesus' name. And then tell them the kingdom of God has come near to you. I challenge you, put this teaching to use. Faith without works is dead. So what you have learned from me, put it to use this week. Share the gospel with at least one person. Now, at our next session, next week, a week from today, I'm going to address the following question. Why do we often fail to heal the sick. Well, next week we will find out. We fail primarily because of the little faith or doubt that we have that the person will be healed. Typically, when we're ministering to the sick, there will be some doubt, some question in our heart. We will be thinking, what if the person is not healed? What if the person is not healed? If you have that kind of thinking, what if the person is not healed? That means you have doubt. And when you have doubt, you will fail. 
And this doubt, this little faith will be addressed in our next session. So come back a week from today to find out why is it that we often fail to heal the sick? Why is it that even when we try to issue commands, even when we try to use authority and power, very often people are not healed? Next week on Monday, I will address this very important question. Why do we usually fail to heal the sick despite this power and authority which the Lord has given us? It turns out that in addition to the power and authority that the Lord gives us, we must have something called faith or mountain moving faith. I will address this next week.